to uh, uh, Dr. Sean, Dr. Vitek. It's just so such an honor for me to continue to participate in the Fellows Day, and I and I'm just uh, so proud of everything that you've accomplished as this uh, course has continued on uh, through several different um, uh, years at this point, and it's it's just one of the greatest uh, opportunities that I have, and I'm so I'm I'm just so glad to to be able to participate and to everybody who's here today. You're like the tip of the spear. Thank goodness you're willing to come and learn and listen to all of this work and then disseminate it and uh, be become leaders in the field uh, to, to help our patients on, on so many levels to get the care uh, that they need in a, in a context that's, that's high, at high level and, and highly also compassionate. And so uh, with that, th thank you both so much for having me and um, for everybody here who's participating, it just means a lot. Um, the, the primary emphasis of, of my work has been on understanding how fertility preservation can uh, be incorporated into the care of patients with breast cancer. I'm a, I'm a surgical oncologist, primarily taking care of patients with breast cancer. That, so that's been my, my, uh, my primary, uh, one of my primary life uh, career missions is to, to come to understand how to do this and, and then how to do it uh, thoughtfully and, and carefully. Um, and we'll talk a little bit today about why this is, has been such an interesting issue. Um, as you all know, and this is such a, such a sophisticated group of people, so I want to apologize in advance if I'm being too, too fundamental at cer certain places, but, but just to, to start from the baseline, what our patients with breast cancer are facing are, are many different therapeutic endpoints now. And one thing that I want to emphasize today is, again, how much immunotherapy is, is becoming part of the uh, standard of care for, for patients with aggressive subtypes. And so how immunotherapy is going to play into this uh, uh, complex sort of um, uh, symphony of care for our breast cancer patients is something that we're, we're just starting to consider now. Um, but baseline chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery all have impact on fertility. And there are, have been several different initiatives for our, our, our young patients, both uh, basic science and clinical initiatives and, and psychosocial components, as well as ethical questions that have been raised uh, to best discuss how this can be possible for particularly for young young women uh, that are contending with a, a breast cancer diagnosis. And um, I'm gonna talk a bit today on options, tamoxifen, some basic research I've done on this topic, and uh, then maybe we can have a chance to do some, some cases in, in clinical practice. So I'm gonna start off sort of in a not so positive way. Um, Incidence of breast cancer in the United States is increasing. Uh, breast cancer facts and figures are in for 2019-2020, uh, with now well over 200,000 cases being identified in the U.S., 268,000 uh, at, at, at least, and uh, that's just invasive cases. Um, about 48,000 in situ cases, which also have impact on fertility plans for young patients. That being said, mortality rate is down a bit uh, from this year, uh, this past year from 50,000 to, to slightly over 40,000. So that's something positive I can add to, to our story. Um, also important to know that mean age of diagnosis is high. So breast cancer is a, is a disease of, of, of somewhat older women, which is fortunate in terms of the fertility uh, balance. Um, my interest in my clinical practice um, has largely been uh, emphasized on young patients with cancer, and that tends to be the group of patients that, that, I, that are referred into, into my practice. Um, importantly, that makes up about 60,000 of the newly diagnosed patients if we're looking at patients up to age um, 49. Um, to that end, though, as our, as our story today is most focused on those that are diagnosed 45, 40, and under, which is somewhere between 13 and 20,000, uh, depending on what sources that you're, you're taking a look at. And as you're also acutely aware, as women are deferring childbearing for other um, uh, for multiple reasons, um, and, and how high highly demographic it is based on where you are in the United States, when the age of, um, of first birth would be, um, you know, how the breast cancer incidence issue um, intersects with that time point for, for first birth is different regionally. That being said, though, age of first birth has increased significantly over the last 30 years to a point now where we are seeing a greater intersection between 
those patients who are ready to have a child, but then may also can be confronted with a diagnosis of breast cancer. And so with that, we find ourselves today trying to discuss how to, how to balance these two very complicated and competing set, sets of circumstances. As a surgeon, I'm typically the point of entry for newly diagnosed uh, patients with, um, with breast cancer, though I believe that that is going to change um, in the next 10 years. And I'm gonna to talk to you a, a bit why that's the case, which further implies how important it is for um, reproductive endocrinologists to have a close tie to surgeons, but also a very close tie to medical oncologists to help uh, um, uh, achieve fertility preservation in the cancer setting. Um, it's so critical that uh, we talk to the patient about what their goals of care will be in addition to considering pregnancy and future fertility. There is a significant opportunity for miscommunication when the patient, patient first presents. Um, and there's associated bias with the patient's age of presentation, uh, whether or not the patient's already had a child, what their partner status is, and potentially an assumption that adjuvant therapy won't be indicated that can, can, can allow us to lose time in this critical need for, um, for the patient's referral to REI at the soonest possible time point. So the thing I wanted to emphasize about timing today is that indications for neoadjuvant therapy for patients with aggressive bre uh, breast cancer subtypes has just expanded significantly. And that's associated with an FDA uh, approval of Pembrolizumab actually July 26th. So just this past summer, Pembro has come to be what is now going to be standard of care for patients with locally advanced triple negative breast cancer um, along with carboplatin. So instead of going to surgery, our patients uh, with locally advanced findings are, are, and it's actually an interesting indication if you read about the keynote uh, trial, it's, it's early stage locally advanced. So it's sort of giving you some latitude here to understand how you want to impart this new therapeutic approach. And this is a, a checkpoint inhibitor along with chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, and then the patient with triple negative breast cancer would go to surgery and then stay on Pembro for several months after, after completion of their, um, after completion of surgery. So it is a really, with the option for additional chemo. So now not just patients with HER2 positive cancer, uh, but patients with triple negative breast cancer are going to be basically seen in our office, seen along with a medical oncologist and potentially within a week's time could get started on their neoadjuvant uh, therapy regimens. And so we're going to have to just be really mindful of how to balance these expectations for timeliness with plans for fertility preservation for our, for our patients with aggressive subtypes, which would be the triple negative, so hormone insensitive and HER2 negative, as well as the HER2 positive patients. And they make up about 30% of the newly diagnosed cancer patients we see in the US every year. About 70% of patients are hormone receptor positive. And for those cases, the majority of those patients will go to surgery first, which allows us a little bit more time to incorporate fertility preservation because most surgeries are happening about a month from the time that the patient comes in newly diagnosed into the surgical clinic. Just even more with COVID constraints, uh, time to surgery is, is probably somewhere between a month and six weeks for most very uh, high, high volume referral centers in the US. So I wanna just, the, the take home of this slide is to say indications for neoadjuvant therapy, which have a much shorter time point to initiation of treatment have expanded. So more of our patients are going to be on a tighter timeline than they had been previously. And so I want us all to be understanding if it feels like there's some added pressure or more volume of patients coming in saying, I need an urgent referral to REI for fertility preservation. And this is as a result of newly expanded indications for neoadjuvant therapy for triple negative breast cancer patients as of this past summer. Um, I, as you all are so aware, the impact of infertility on survivorship for patients um, of all cancers is, is profound. Um, for breast cancer patients, that's, that's certainly the case. Um, and a reason why this has become so critical to me, to me in my practice is that um, of the uh, breast cancer survivors uh, that had been polled in a, in a study from some years back, 57% re reported a, a substantial concern about fertility and 
and, I, and nearly 30% said that their concerns about maintaining fertility actually influenced their decision to pursue treatment. And so I think once you see that, you recognize how much that genuflects back on why it's so important for us to, as providers, factor this in so, so significantly into our care plan so that we can have our patients actually avail themselves of the life-saving breast cancer treatments that we have uh, been able to, uh, to discover in, in 2021. If the patients won't take them, then, then what good have, have we really um, accomplished? That being said, it remains a problem to communicate with our patients about um, fertility preservation. And, and as in the breast cancer care arena, I think, I think it still remains a concern whose responsibility is this to talk about the patients. Um, at, at the most recent data that I've identified, it's between 26 and 71% of breast cancer patients recall, recall having a discussion about fertility with their breast cancer provider while about half of patients actually would, would state that they would, not, would hope to have one after treatment. That being said, 10% of women, less than 10% of women under age 40 at diagnosis have been going on to have a child in data that I've uh, recently seen. Um, and, and with a survey of breast cancer surgeons in Canada, 36% said they rarely or never discussed fertility and more than half uh, said they didn't really believe it was their responsibility to do so. So this is why this, this Fellows Day is so critical, right? We have to be able to increase the understanding of how to discuss these issues in practice. Um, this data is, is somewhat old, older data from Northwestern that actually showed how important being able to have a program with a multidisciplinary team of providers, including a patient navigator, how statistically significant um, it influenced uh, documented discussions uh, with providers about the treatment effects for breast cancer patients on fertility, the number of patients offered a preservation appointment, uh, those who actually went, and then those who actually went on to have a procedure. So it just, again, emphasizing how important a patient navigator is, how important a, a program is. Obviously, you're all incredibly well-versed in the different options that exist for our patients with breast cancer. And so uh, not a lot of need for me to delve into this, but what I was hoping to do today um, after just highlighting a bit about GnRH agonists uh, for our breast cancer patients, this was a highly and, and hotly debated topic. I do believe that um, uh, Dr. Lambertini has sort of made it part of his life's mission to, to think about this work and to do a lot of, um, of thoughtful uh, analysis on this. So that now what we can say is that GnRH agonist administration is happening with the perception that it is going to improve um, potentially uh, uh, the um, fertility preservation of patients who are undergoing chemotherapy uh, with disease-free and overall survival from breast cancer being unchanged. I'm happy to hear your thoughts on this, but I think given Lambertini's uh, publication in the JCO in 2018, this has become now uh, a less debated topic, a more accepted uh, treatment path. But some data that I wanted to show you today, I haven't, I haven't shown in a little while, is work that we did um, several years ago to address how fertility treatments actually are impacting different uh, breast cancer cell types, as well as normal and mortal uh, mammary cells, um, to, to confirm or to demonstrate the safety, at least in an in vitro model, for, for our patients with breast cancer. And so the reason that was motivating the, the work, this basic work I'm about to show you is just so many studies were coming out in decades past with several different cohorts that had highly complicated to understand results because there was so little control over the, the study design to assess whether the uh, Clomid, as well as the different gonadotropins that are used to uh, allow for stimulation to happen, how they were really impacting breast cancer risk in different settings. And so to try to control for that in the lab, based on all these issues with study design, as, as I've mentioned, heterogeneity of patient population, unknown information on, on family history, a lack of focus on the cause of infertility, um, different you know, regimens that were being used that were not being transparently described, what we decided to do is head into the lab and, and look at these questions for um, normal immortalized breast cells, hormone receptor positive uh, um, breast cancer cells, as well as, um, a triple negative breast cancer cell line that was also BRCA1 mutated. 
and we expose these uh, different cell types to FSH, LH, HCG, clomid, estrogen, and progesterone. And we did cell proliferation assays as well as 3D culture. And you know, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, but what we were able to identify is that um, estrogen and clomid really had no effect as you would expect on the hormone insensitive normal immortalized breast cells. Uh, progestin and HCG um, did uh, result in a decrease in cell proliferation and colony size. And um, uh, as we moved on to the MCF7 cells that are hormone receptor positive, as was expected, increasing exposure to estrogen, escalating doses of estrogen resulted in cell proliferation for these hormone sensitive cells, as well as uh, colony size in, in 3D culture of these, of these breast cancer cells. Uh, but that again, HCG highly cytotoxic, which I think is, was an interesting observation. Um, and even more so because HCG, if you can see here, highly cytotoxic to the triple negative cells. And when I went back to the literature to look at this, this was not a new finding. Actually, it had been published in cancer research years past that HCG is highly cytotoxic to breast cells, including triple negative breast cancer cells. And reassuringly, actually FSH and um, LH resulted in little or no change in all of our cell types. And so I really found this data to be highly reassuring. And just to give a little aside about this is that we tried to publish all this data in one big human reproduction paper, but actually human reproduction um, rejected the data on FSH and LH because they said, well, this data is negative. But then we submitted it to fertility and sterility and they were like, we love this data, right? This is the data we want because it's so reassuring to us um, that what we're doing could be safe for breast cancer patients. And they published it in a separate uh, manuscript. Um, and then interestingly, you know, a group in Italy saw the data and it invited me out to come and present all of it because they were like, this is the kind of information we, we're seeking to provide some contextual framework to reassure our patients that they can go through um, ovarian stimulation and they can be exposed to these different treatments with uh, some reassurance that there is minimal impact on safety. That being said, as you would expect, for the patients who are hormone receptor positive, a certain hypothesis was identified about the importance of the opportunity to have a healthy pregnancy in the shortest possible time frame. And so this isn't gonna be the population of patients that you say, we're gonna go and we're gonna give you escalating doses of Clomid and we're going to give you, you know, exposure with IUI and we're gonna see where you wind up my thinking on this is really that the HCG levels of the healthy pregnancy may be very, may be very protective in this population. And you're really seeking the opportunity to find that cadence to get the patient to a healthy pregnancy, which may mitigate some of the estrogen related, perhaps less favorable um, impacts for patients who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Further to this point, I want to highlight a recent JAMA oncology paper, a Swedish study, which I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen, which showed in about 400 patients that successful pregnancy after breast cancer was possible for women who had or hadn't undergo fertility preservation at time of diagnosis, but a significantly um, higher likelihood of post-breast cancer, assisted reproduction, and live birth was observed for patients who had fertility preservation without any negative association uh, on all cause survival. And so this is just, I think, another really great study that just reaffirms this data for our patients. I like to show this slide because of, of course it has uh, Dr. Teresa Woodruff on it and my husband, Lonnie Shea, and some of the earlier work they did as well, looking at the impact of more basic work on trying to advance the field of fertility preservation using nascent follicles and showing the impact of three-dimensional culture to improve um, in vitro follicle maturation. And you can see here in 2D culture how fractious and chaotic the oocyte is. But then when we apply three-dimensional techniques, how beautiful and normalized it can become. And with the use of then application of hormone uh, uh, stimulation in the, in the uh, nutrient um, a media that we can actually stimulate the follicle and that this resulted in live births, which really helped to push the field of in, follicle, in vitro follicle maturation along. And so it's fun to think about where the field started and where it's gone um, as of today for our patients. Um, 
So now just segueing back to thinking about patients with breast cancer, I, I do again, as, as we've discussed, um, I wanna highlight how chemotherapy contributes to uh, and may, may impact fertility for our young patients. Um, and additionally, how tamoxifen, which is a teratogen, has changed from a five to 10 year uh, treatment span. Uh, and so this is a really complicated issue for hormone receptor positive patients to try to negotiate now that it's a decade of, of treatment with tamoxifen versus the previous five years. Um, radiation and other surgical treatments may have impact on future pregnancy. But I do want to reassure you again that recent data coming out of Molly Morvick's group and the Northwestern group showed that for more than 200 patients who are undergoing fertility preservation counseling, no difference in time to next cancer treatment was identified compared to patients who elected not to undergo uh, fertility preservation treatment. Um, so that we are showing we can do this well as we're timing the care for our patients. Um, as you all are, are talking about it at such a sophisticated level where we're trying to understand baseline fertility for our patients before they initiate treatment with chemotherapy, we're using random start protocols, we're doing things to minimize circulating estrogen levels, and also we're implementing improved cryopreservation techniques for um, frozen oocytes as well as tissue cryo to, include, to improve life birth rates uh, beyond embryo cryo at, at baseline. And so I, again, I like to show this, this figure from our original New England Journal paper that sort of highlighted what we hoped we were going to be able to accomplish and now what we are accomplishing for, for our young patients with, uh, with cancer. Um, and now just briefly want to touch on patients who are mutation carriers, because I'm sure you, you are seeing these patients in your, or if you, you will be seeing these patients in your practice as well. And so um, young patients with mutations, typically BRCA1 patients are gonna end up with aggressive subtypes, uh, especially triple negative for the BRCA1s. Um, and these mutations actually are associated with very high risk for the development of breast cancer, 40 to 80% lifetime risk, 10 to 50% lifetime risk for ovarian cancer. And these risks are uh, for cancer penetrants are happening far younger for patients um, affected than in the um, sporadic population. So age of 40 for um, patients with these mutations for ovarian cancer, as well as early 40s for patients um, who are uh, BRCA1 or two mutation carriers that, uh, for the development of breast cancer. So much earlier than the non-BRCA population. Um, as this mutation relates to a plan for pregnancy, a lot of stress is emphasizing how and when to have a bilateral mastectomy and when to undergo a, a BSO. And I'm sure you all have many interesting thoughts on how you're discussing these issues with your patients. Um, typically we've recommended after childbearing for uh, patients to undergo a BSO, though some patients with early and high penetrant uh, ovarian cancer uh, families, they may opt to go through oocyte harvest, ovarian tissue cryo, and then, um, have a BSO and have a subsequent pregnancy using uh, cryopreserved tissues. Lastly, what I want to touch, touch on for this patient population is PGD. And really just emphasizing this last bullet point here and something that I find very intriguing and also highly complicated. And it's that the intention for patients who are identified as having a BRCA mutation, who are interested in uh, potentially um, also going through IVF, PGD does not um, change the desire. The, the, the intention to go through PGD does not change when the patient finds out that they're a mutation carrier. And we're really struggling to know why this is. And there are probably so many, right, that have financial associations, but also the great sensitivity around deciding how to use embryos that you've created which really points towards our need to do further research on this topic and provide additional counseling for our patients who've undergone bracket testing to consider what PGD might be able to offer them in terms of embryo um, creations and selection uh, and future pregnancy. But again, my primary goal in this issue is informed consent so that our patients know that this is an option for them when they're trying to decide how to move forward. Um, and we did create an algorithm of care uh, to, to encompass how to manage patients with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, ER negative, ER positive patients, um, and how to manage fertility preservation for all these different, uh, different patients with different cell types. And we continue to consider this and to expand on this information, I think now with 
immunotherapy becoming such a significant part of our treatment plan. And so I'm just going to move forward just to quickly um, conclude my, my thoughts on uh, tamoxifen specifically, as this has now become a 10-year plan for our patients. And we've also recognized uh, through data published in the New England Journal now a few years back that risk that was once thought to be relatively low for patients who were hormone receptor positive, typically our patients with the best um, uh, prognosis, actually recurrence occurred steadily throughout a five to 20 year study period. So I think we should only consider that while tamoxifen treatment now is recommended uh, for 10 years, my sense is that it's gonna increase and, and it's just gonna keep going up and up as patients demonstrate they can tolerate this treatment. So 10 years, maybe 15 and maybe 20 in the next uh, five to 10 years that we're giving these discussions. A way I wanna lean into tamoxifen, which is prescribed for hormone receptor positive patients at the completion of all their breast cancer care is that it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, a sister drug to Clomid and highly impactful in terms of its capacity to result in a 47% reduction in annual uh, recurrence risk, 26% reduction in annual mortality, 47% reduction in contralateral uh, breast cancer. But our youngest patients were not taking it. And we then questioned and queried a very large group of patients at Northwestern as to why that was the case. And interestingly, the Dana-Farber group just redoed this study and published it in Cancer a few months ago uh, to, to, re to reinforce these studies and, and reduplicate our findings, which I can only tell you stresses how important it is for us to be talking to our hormone receptor positive patients who have an indication for tamoxifen about how they can potentially balance their fertility goals with, um, with the indication to, to take tamoxifen over a long period. And this work just shows that Desire for fertility at diagnosis was highly associated with not initiating tamoxifen. And it was also a significant reason why patients did not continue with tamoxifen after they started it. And putting all of this together, I wanna to tell you that there is excellent evidence from our original studies with tamoxifen to show that we can delay initiation and still result in a significant risk reduction. And this comes from the French study it comes from the early breast cancer trialist group. It comes from a Wisconsin study with a seven to eight year delay in initiation that support a potential tailored delay in tamoxifen therapy to allow a time for pregnancy uh, with the expectation that you would complete at least 10 years of treatment in our youngest patient group. Additionally, excellent data showing that subsequent pregnancy does not negatively impact breast cancer prognosis for patients who then go on to have a pregnancy. And that data has been shown retrospectively again and again. And as most of you have uh, understand, we really can't offer our patients a prospective study because we can't really randomize our patients who have survived breast cancer to baby or no baby and then see what happens. So our retrospective data is really the best we're going to have outside of what we are awaiting in terms of the International Breast Cancer uh, Study Group positive trial. And I'm sure that positive is open in many centers that you um, are all coming from today, where we are actually asking our patients who've survived breast cancer to go on about two years of, of anti-hormonal therapy, either with tamoxifen or uh, GnRH uh, analog plus aromatase inhibitors. And those are really directed for patients 35 and younger, the highest risk uh, ER positive uh, young patients uh, that would see aromatase inhibitors. Two years, then go off for about three months for a washout period then a two year window for pregnancy and breastfeeding with an expectation that the patient will then return to anti-hormonal therapy for a total of 10 years. So these tri this trial is open around the US. Um, uh, Ann Partridge is the PI in the US for this study. And so we are very much looking forward to the prospective results, but they are many years in the, to come. And so at the same time though, I want to make you aware of this study design as you think about how to incorporate this into your practice. I think another critical issue to consider is how we balance breast cancer fertility and pregnancy. The, the thing I really wanna to stress to all of you is that we have been giving chemotherapy to our patients who are pregnant for many, many years at this point, more than two decades. And so we can expect our patients who are diagnosed by the second trimester uh, with breast cancer that they can keep their pregnancy and they can undergo chemotherapy with the expectation that they will have a healthy pregnancy 
um, and a healthy child that will reach uh, developmental milestones. And so I just want to impart that to you as you, as you, if you're faced with this question and how, how to manage it, that, that this is possible and we are um, doing this uh, and have been for, for, for many years. And so with this, I just want to conclude uh, by saying young survivors are, are a unique patient population contending with di distinct survivorship issues. Uh, for patients who are hormone receptor positive, um, there are several different uh, uh, that factors associated with uh, taking tamoxifen that I think REIs can help a lot with in terms of balancing patients' expectations. Um, we really want to work to improve tamoxifen initiation persistence through collaborative treatment plans. There are still a lot of issues associated with communication of fertility preservation to young patients, uh, despite the fact that this is an, AS, an ASCO, ASRM, NCCN guideline. Um, and we really need to work together uh, to help um, provide multidisciplinary care for our young patients so that we can get our patients to uh, fertility preservation, those who are interested at the earliest possible time point. So I really have so many people to thank uh, for all of the work that they've done and all the support we've received, um, including my lab and all the different members that have participated in the work over so many years, more than I can fit on this slide now. Um, and, you know, I have a couple of cases. I just wanted to just quickly, quickly talk through. I know I'm at the end of my time. Um, but I just want to highlight two cases that I saw uh, early on in my practice. One is a 34-year-old mom of two who had stage 3A uh, breast cancer, so certainly locally advanced. She did successfully pursue embryo cryopreservation and often stated that her knowledge of fertility preservation really helped her to persevere through treatment. Um, she had a baby, went back on tamoxifen, but I think what was very stressful about this case was that there was some pushback because her prognosis was considered to be poor. How do we reconcile that with our young breast cancer patients? And then this last patient who I've, I've kept in touch with over a number of years, who is an elite US triathlete diagnosed with HER2 positive breast cancer. When she presented to the clinic, all she could really do is talk about how she had these races and how she was actually undergoing chemo and getting hydrated during her races. She had no real interest in fertility preservation and her life was, was much more focused on um, her athletic goals. And she was a very high level exec executive. And um, subsequent to her uh, treatment of her adjuvant care, adjuvant treat, neoadjuvant and adjuvant treatment, she ended up on tamoxifen and on a uh, trastuzumab for a year, which is standard of care and never regained her fertility. And um, she stated tremendous regret that she did not seek uh, counseling for fertility preservation at the time of diagnosis. Um, and uh, she moved out to the West Coast and saw a lot of, um, a lot of support, but was never able to, to have a, a biologic child. And so I think this just points out to me that there are so many ethical components to taking care of young, young patients with breast cancer, but the key is to refer get the patients to REI to uh, have a conversation and informed consent about what their options are. These patients are just starting to understand their, their new reality with a breast cancer diagnosis. And it's a lot to expect them to feel that they really see a 360 view of what it is going to be like to undergo treatment, but also to imagine a healthy survivorship period. And, and I think what, you know, what Molly Moravac, one of my close collaborators here at Michigan uh, who runs the fertility preservation program just said over a, we, we ran a symposium over the weekend and she just was really emphasizing how it's the happiest part of a terrible time getting our patients to see fertility preservation and you offer such an important um, window into what future life uh, and a happy life can really look like and I think you I hope you will really embrace that uh, in your in your practice so thank you so much and and happy to take any questions as I know, I know we're, we're, we're running short on time, but thank, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, I see some clapping in the chat. Any other questions for Dr. Jaros? Okay, is there, I have a question. Is there evidence of interruption or delay in initiation of tamoxifen for high risk LCIS ADH patients taking tamoxifen for prevention of invasive breast cancer? Well, I mean, that's such an incredibly thoughtful question. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really appreciate it. You know, my sense is I want to, what I want to offer is that if we're telling patients now who've been treated for invasive cancer, that you can go ahead and, um, 
and have a delay in initiation to pursue a pregnancy. And I'll also tell you, and I, it was incredibly moving to me to have a young patient who had a, who lost a child, who'd had a, a, a cardiac anomaly and had a de- sudden death of a child. She was 44. And then she went on to have um, a diagnosis of DCIS right as she was beginning to plan for, for REI t- to undergo um, reproductive endocrinology uh, treatment to have a second child after the death of her child. Um, she ended up saying that she wanted to delay, we treated her DCIS, so even a more advanced uh, finding than LCS and ADH, she had lumpectomy radiation, and then we actually had her go on, and she ended up having a a natural pregnancy, unbelievably, delivering at 45, and she's now on on tamoxifen uh, for what will be a 10-year course, and she's doing very well, and that was about five years ago. I, I think that we, we are looking to say that we are not identifying from the French study, from the Wisconsin study, from the early breast cancer trialist group studies, the delay in, um, in initiation of treatment has not resulted in adverse outcomes for patients with cancer. So I, I think you can extrapolate that even further to the high risk atypias and, and, and believe that that's safe. But I still think you want to encourage your patients uh, with atypia to take tamoxifen, though I, I will couch that with all comers, non, non-pregnant patients or non-patients not desiring fertility preservation, those patients with atypias um, and high-risk lesions, the uh, long-term um, uh, completion of therapy is like 5%. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. So, so much we can do to help encourage our patients to take treatment, but uh, it still remains a big challenge clinically to encourage patients to take tamoxifen for prevention. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm always so impressed with your talk, seeing it year after year after year. I feel like, you know, you're doing like what, like radical mastectomy was what (laughs) standard in the 70s. And now women get by with these very minimally invasive treatment plans. I feel like you're, you're leading that change for women who desire pregnancy each year. The message gets more and more positive for women who have breast cancer. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. It's been a really exciting, you know, part of my you know, career and my opportunity to uh, improve care for young patients with cancer, hopefully so that they, you know, can, can come back and feel like they can, you know, take, take part in all, in all the novel discovery that's happening and not have to make critical sacrifices. But the new expanded indications for immunotherapy are only going to force our, you know, force us to get back to work and think about how to safely implement uh, fertility care in, in the context of immunotherapy. So just, uh, just something new and exciting for breast cancer patients and a new challenge on the fertility side, but things are improving. And mm-hmm. I think for me, one of the most remarkable things is to see so many of my patients coming back with their babies now. Mm-hmm. That's the best. Mm-hmm. 